Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Branwell, and I am moderating the panel on FBAR latest development. And my daughter, Lisa, is going to be joining us in the discussion. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please, uh, Sarah. The uh, panelists for today's program are Andrea uh, Cortez, from uh, who's a partner in our Tampa office, Jim Dawson, who's a partner in our West Palm office, uh, Chad Vanderhoff, who's a partner in our Tampa office, and uh, I'm uh, from the uh, DC office. Uh, please advance the slide. Today, uh, we'll be discussing everything you wanted to know about FBARs. And uh, we're first going to have a background discussion uh, about what FBARs are, and then talk about the recent Supreme Court case called Bittner, which was a significant taxpayer victory. And then we're going to move on to some hot topics in the area, including uh, how courts are interpreting willfulness for FBAR purposes, the use of the Administrative Procedure Act in FBAR litigation, and then a very interesting case that deals with uh, treaty tiebreakers and the requirement of those types of folks to file uh, an FBAR. If you could advance the slide, please, uh, Sarah, to the, the next um, uh, one, please. Uh, we're we're really now just going to go into the background of uh, FBARs, and let me turn it over to Andrea, who's going to provide the context for uh, what we will be discussing. Thanks, Alan. Okay, we're going to jump into what is the FBAR, and I think probably to some in the audience, it might seem that the FBAR has only been around for <laughs> 20 years or so, because I think Nobody really paid attention to it um, before the early 2000s, but it's actually been around since 1970 when Congress enacted the Bank Secrecy Act. And this is codified under Title 31 of the, um, of the Code on uh, Money and Finance. And the act requires U.S. persons to retain records and to file reports that would enable the government to combat money laundering and tax evasion. Under the act, FinCEN has the rulemaking authority and FinCEN then delegated the authority to enforce the FBARs to the IRS. So we're gonna focus on the reporting requirement um, and the report that is required is the FBAR, which is Form 114. U.S. persons are required to file FBARs to report either a financial interest in or signature or other authority over foreign financial accounts, provided the aggregate value exceeds $10,000 at any time during a calendar year. We're going to dig in each of these bolded terms um, in the next few minutes. I could advance the slide, please. All right, so who is a U.S. person? A U.S. person includes a U.S. citizen, also includes a U.S. resident, and that we're going to cover in a little bit more detail in the Arreste case with Alan, which specifically is going to um, look at whether a non-resident under a treaty tiebreaker test would also be treated as a U.S. resident for FBAR purposes. But at least for purposes of our background discussion, just know that this is residency as it's defined in Code Section 7701B6, which includes U.S. green card holders and also substantial presence taxpayers. So in addition to US citizens and residents, it also includes US entities, corporations, partnerships, LLCs, trusts and estates that are formed under the laws of the US or any state in the United States, the District of Columbia, any US territory or possession, or also Indian tribe. Next slide. What is a financial interest? Um, financial interest can be both direct or indirect. In terms of a direct financial interest, this would be a U.S. person is named as the owner of record or the holder of legal title. So if a person is, you know, holds an account in their name or even, um, you know, this can come up sometimes with a U.S. trustee of a trust. If a U.S. person has title on a foreign account as trustee of the ABC Trust. That would also be a direct 
interest for FR reporting purposes. Um, in terms of an indirect interest, there are two main categories. It's when the owner of record or the holder of title is either an agent nominee or attorney holding that account on behalf of a U.S. person. So this might be a foreign attorney has funds in their escrow account for a U.S. person. Um, it can also be a, an indirect interest through an entity, so corporation partnership, in which the U.S. person holds directly or indirectly greater than 50% of the total vote or value in the entity. And just one point on that is you do not attribute ownership um, for purposes of FBAR reporting. Next slide. Uh, Andrew, before we get there, I just wanted to um, highlight that if, if a non-resident, a non-US person forms a US LLC, and that US LLC owns a foreign financial account within the requisite amount, there is yes. Or yes, and likewise, mm -hmm. likewise for a trust, which is a, a, a US trust. Uh, but another question is, uh, do you have a view as to whether a financial interest in, includes uh, an interest in, in crypto? Well, you know, does it now or will it in the future? I think possibly going forward, we might see a change, but as of right now, crypto is not reportable on an FBAR. Okay. All right, for signature authority. Signature authority is the authority of an individual, either by themselves or in connection with another individual, can control the disposition of assets held in the foreign financial account by any kind of direct communication, whether that's by phone, or in writing, um, you know, to the financial institution that maintains the account. So we see this often with um, a parent who might add a child onto an account as a power of attorney. Um, if that child has either by themselves or in connection with that parent, the ability to control the disposition of assets that that would qualify as FBAR reportable. Um, sometimes you also see this with entities. If you've got a U.S. person that's a director, officer, or employee of a company. Um, and they have signing authority on those company accounts that are foreign accounts, then that would qualify as being reported um, on the FBAR as signature or other authority. Next slide. Hasn't there been some delay in reporting for certain signature authorities with over 25 accounts or something like that? Yes, I was going to get that into another section, but okay. you're right. So um, the FBAR does provide for more limited information if the filer has 25 or more accounts in which they've got financial interest or signature authority. So what is a foreign financial account? First, let's just start with what a financial account is. That would include a bank account, checking accounts, savings account, brokerage, time deposit, CD. Um, also can include insurance policies with a cash value, annuities with a cash value, Typically doesn't include pensions, but it can if that pension is treated more like a brokerage account for U.S. purposes. Um, does not include a safe deposit box, although if the safe deposit box is accessible to the financial institution, um, you know, if the, the holder of the safe deposit box can provide authorization to the financial institution to go into that box and dispose of the contents, um, then that may be reportable for FBAR. And we see that sometimes with safe deposit box that hold um, gold or precious metals or other gemstones. Um, so what does it mean to be a foreign financial account? Here you're going to focus on the location of the account itself. So it's a financial account that's located outside the U.S. or U.S. territory. So um, Puerto Rico, for example, um, would if you've got an account in Puerto Rico, that would not be considered a foreign financial account for FBAR purposes. Um, also, you know, You've got sometimes foreign banks that have U.S. branches. I know um, Von Tobel, Swiss Bank Von Tobel um, has branches, I think, still in New York, maybe some other places. If you've got an account with a New York branch of a Swiss bank, that is not a foreign financial account for FBAR purposes. Next slide. So what kind of information is reported? Um, there are five parts to the form. Part one is just the filer information. So that's the taxpayer identification details, name, address, social or ITIN, date of birth. Also, here's where you um, indicate the number of accounts and then the form will direct you if you've got 
25 or more accounts in which you've either got a financial interest or signature authority, you are allowed to provide more limited information. Um, part two is for accounts that are separately held. For each account, you're going to include the name and address of the foreign financial institution, the account number, the type of the account, and the maximum account value. If you don't know the account value, you can tick a box that it's unknown, but I would just stress that it's a, you know, should make, the filer should make every effort to, to determine what the maximum account value is. When you're reporting the account value on the FBAR, you do not reduce those values by any sort of duplication of funds. If you've got multiple accounts and you've moved funds from one account to another, you still report the maximum in each of those accounts on the form. Uh, part three of the form is for accounts that are jointly held. You include all the same information as part two, but you also indicate the identifying details of the principal joint owner. Part four of the form is for signature authority. And there's a part five for consolidated FBAR reporting. And that is when you have an entity that qualifies as a US filer. And that entity also holds um, directly or indirectly greater than 50% of another entity that would also qualify as a filer, then you can file the top tier entity files a consolidated report for all of the information. The lower tier entity does not have to separately file um, a, another form. Next slide, please. So when and where to file. Um, some on the call might remember filing paper forms with the U.S. Treasury in Detroit. Um, that is no longer the case since 2013, I believe, the FBAR has been filed electronically through the BSA e-filing system. And since uh, the 2016, I think it was the, the 2016 FBAR was the first year where they tied the filing deadline to the filing deadline for individual income tax returns. So that is now April 15th of the year following the calendar year being reported. If you've missed that April 15th deadline, um, no worries, Vincent has been granting automatic extensions until October 15th. So you don't need to file a form to get that FBAR filing extension to October 15th. I'm not sure when that will end, but as of right now, that's still in place. So if you, if you miss the April 15th filing this year, please file your FBAR by October 15th. Now, um, even though this is tied to the individual income tax return filing, if you've got a, a U.S. person who resides outside the United States, and so their filing deadline is a little bit different, they have until June 15th to file, and then they can file an extension to October 15th. If they request that additional two-month extension to December 15th, I do not believe that that extends the, the FBAR filing deadline. So even if those individuals have until December 15th for the income tax return, they should file the FBAR, FBAR by October 15th. Next slide. Penalties. Um, here again, the IRS has the authority to assess and collect FBAR penalties. The purpose is supposed to be to promote compliance. The level of penalties varies depending on whether or not the filer was willful or non-willful in their failure to report. I'm not getting going to get into a detailed discussion on that only because I think that's going to be covered by Chad and by Jim. Um, but just to note, there are varying levels of penalties. So if an agent feels that um, issuing a warning letter to the taxpayer would be sufficient to promote compliance on a going forward basis, that agent may just issue that letter and not issue any penalties. If the agent feels a penalty is appropriate, um, the agent can issue a non-willful penalty, which is now, thanks to a recent Supreme Court um, ruling, up to $10,000 per form, not per account. And the agent also has the discretion to look at other mitigating factors like reasonable cause. Um, that $10,000 per report is a, is a ceiling and not a floor. So there are also mitigation guidelines in the Internal Revenue Manual that provide for lower penalties um, for instance, if the account balances are, are low. Um, on the other hand, in terms of willful penalties, the willful penalty is the greater of $100,000 or 50% of the maximum account balance in the accounts at the time of violation. That again is a, is a ceiling, um, not a floor, although I'm not sure that I've seen instances where a willful penalty is has been imposed at less than you know, that maximum. 
Next slide. Before penalties are assessed, if, if you discover that you um, are non-compliant with respect to your FBAR reporting, there are a number of alternatives that you can use to remediate FBAR non-compliance. Um, you can simply file an amended FBAR. So if, if you, you know, inadvertently didn't include some information or you made a mistake in the account balance or something, you can simply file an FBAR, you tick a little box at the top of the form to indicate it's amended and you correct the information. Um, the issue with this is there's no penalty protection. So again, this would be you know, appropriate when there's sort of mild non-compliance. You know, if, if you're just correcting some information that you know is not significant, it's probably not going to get a lot of attention. But I, I may not recommend this alternative if all of a sudden you're reporting you know, multiple additional accounts with very significant maximum balances, because that could draw some, some scrutiny and some penalties. Um, the next alternative we're going to discuss is the delinquent FBAR submission procedure. This is an appropriate procedure when a filer missed the FBAR filings but does not have any unreported income. So um, think about if the income was already picked up on the return, but the, the filer just didn't realize there was an FBAR form that had to be filed or if um, the accounts didn't earn any income, or in the instances where there's just signature or other authority, you can file in these laid off bars with an explanation and um, no penalties should be assessed on those laid off bars. The third alternative is for streamlined foreign and streamlined domestic. This, these are programs that um, are appropriate for other kinds of, of non-compliance as well, but also appropriate to FBAR non-compliance. Um, under these programs, you're basically filing in three years of, of um, tax returns and international information returns and six years of FBARs. If you meet certain non-residency requirements, you could qualify under streamlined foreign. And then other than just tax and interest on unreported income, there are no other penalties assessed for the late filings. If you're under streamlined domestic, there's a penalty of 5% of the maximum aggregate value of the assets that should have been reported on the FBAR or a similar form, Form 8938, which includes all foreign financial assets. Yeah, Andrea, before you go on, I think we should just mention that for those people who are required to file the Form 8938, you, you have to file both forms, the FBAR and that. 8938, one is not. Yes. Uh, Correct. The 8938 would get attached to either the 1040 or the, the 1040X. Correct. So the, the final remediation alternative we'll discuss is the voluntary disclosure practice. And this is the best alternative when the taxpayer was willful in their failure to file their FBARs and they're really facing a level of criminal exposure. Under this program, there is a two-step preclearance process where um, if you complete the, the preclearance, the filer does receive a clearance letter from IRS criminal investigation and then works with the IRS civil exam to work out the, the taxes and penalties. Under the program, there is a, a minimum of six years of tax and information filings and six years of FBARs. Uh, in addition to a one-time civil fraud penalty on the year with the highest tax amount, there's also a willful FBAR penalty of 50% of the maximum aggregate balance of the foreign financial accounts. Yeah, Andrea, before we get to the litigation part of this, just uh, as another stray fact, maybe you could just uh, comment on something. Uh, if you have a, a U.S. person <clears throat> who wants to expatriate uh, under that provision, generally you're a covered expatriate if you haven't filed uh, the various uh, forms. Uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, forms and reported mm -hmm. your income under Title 26, which is the income tax provisions. What, what if you're also delinquent on, under the FBAR filings? Does that implicate the correct filing uh, uh, under Title 26. So the requirement to be compliant and when you have to certify your, your compliance on Form 8854 for expatriation, that only deals with Title 26 tax, not FBARs. Mm 
So I don't know that that alone would make me say to, to a client, no, you don't need to worry about your FBAR filings. But um, to answer the specific question is you do not have to be compliant on FBAR for the certification on Form 8854. There are ways though, as we said, these are some various ways that you may also become compliant for FBAR purposes. And they just depend on what the facts of the case are to determine which alternative is best suited for that filer. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Litigating FBAR penalties. So switching gears a little bit, if a taxpayer is assessed a penalty, then the likely next step is litigation. Um, again, the FBAR penalty is not a tax, so litigation might be a little bit different here. Um, if the IRS is getting ready to or considering assessing an FBAR penalty, usually the first thing that happens, they will issue letter 3709 and propose the FBAR penalty. The taxpayer then has 30 days to respond and file a written uh, protest to appeal. If the appeal is not granted, then the next letter is the 3708. I'm not quite sure why they're not in consecutive order, but so be it. So the 3708 is to assess the, the FR penalty. That's a notice of um, notice and demand for payment. The taxpayer, assuming they're not going to pay, he or she is not going to pay the FR penalty, then has one more opportunity to contest that penalty by requesting an appeal hearing through the IRS Independent Office of Appeals. If appeals agrees with exam, then they recommend assessment. Um, once the penalty is assessed, the taxpayer can either pay the penalty, assuming the taxpayer doesn't want to pay the penalty, litigation is the next step. So in most cases, it's the U.S. government that would initiate suit against the taxpayer. And that's really for two reasons. First, the government has to bring suit within two years of assessment under Title 31. And then once um, there's a judgment against the taxpayer, that opens up other collection um, avenues for the U.S. government. The taxpayer also could initiate a lawsuit for recovery. Um, you know, one of the questions is, does the taxpayer have to fully pay the penalty or pay any part of the penalty in order to pursue litigation? There was a case back in 2021 that says, again, that, you know, the FBAR is not a tax. It's not under the internal revenue laws or internal revenue taxes. And so there's at least a position that the taxpayer should not need to pay the penalty in order to pursue litigation. But um, I don't know, Jim, if you've got a comment on that, we've sort of talked about it, but, you know, I'm not sure when that would be in the best interest for the taxpayer, too. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I know in Bidrosian, they had done uh, a partial payment uh, and the government uh, then countersued for the full amount. Uh, I've always was a little bit puzzled by that. You know, my view, as we will get into it when we're discussing Bittner and Bidrosian, and the consequences of the of APA is why would you ever give the government an out? Uh, let's see if the government will commit a footfall. There are uh, statute of limitations that they have to abide by and you never know. So I don't believe in giving the, the government opportunity to not commit a footfall. Yeah. Before Chad, just moving on to, oh, sorry. Chad, any additional thoughts? No, I mean, I, I think that's right, Jim. I mean, there's so much at stake that you want to make sure that, you know, the government dots its I's and, and crosses its T's. Um, you know, don't, you know, don't put yourself, you know, in, in court. Let, let, let the government, you know, kind of navigate its way there on its own. Could I just, before we jump into the next section, I see that there's a question on uh, reporting pensions on an FBAR. So just to be clear on that, it's gonna depend on the foreign pension itself. There are some foreign pensions that are treated like brokerage accounts and that those do get reported on the FBAR. There's a position that some other pensions would not go on the FBAR, depending on how much control the taxpayer has over the pension and how it's set up. But um, just a note on that, just from a practical perspective, if that pension is, is filed on the form 8938 anyway, probably just out of an abundance of caution, it doesn't hurt to throw it on the FBAR. So I think okay. that's uh, we're, Thank you, Andrea. We're now gonna move to the second uh, 
aspect of FBARS. And, and we're here going to have a brief discussion of the recent Supreme Court case called Bittner Chad. Uh, why don't you take it on? And then, Jim, I think we'll make some comments as you go. So, you know, Chad, if you let me go with, if you can go to the next slide, slide uh, 17. Uh, I, I'll leave the discussion with the facts um, concerning, as Andrea said, Bittner, a non willful uh, case where it was held to be a, on a poor performed basis. Just as a quick introduction, everybody comes in with a little bit of baggage or a slight bias. Uh, Chad and I worked on the Isaac Schwarzenbaum case uh, through the trial brief and the first appeal. And now Chad is handling the subsequent appeal before the 11th Circuit. So at times you're going to hear our views and it's going to come from the perspective of the case that we dealt with. So let me jump in quickly to Mr. Uh, to Mr. Bittner and the facts. And one thing I'm gonna ask the audience to do is think about this from your client's perspective in terms of the facts. Because this is gonna be a recurring thing. What makes a case willful? What makes a case non-willful? Non and when is there reasonable cause? And I want you to keep thinking about those three important questions. So quickly, let's jump into the facts. Uh, Mr. Bittner was born and raised in Romania. In 1982, he immigrated to the United States and became a naturalized citizen. After the fall of communism, he returned back to Romania and launched a successful business career. Like many dual citizens, he did not appreciate that U.S. law requires him to keep the government apprised of his overseas financial accounts, even while he lived abroad. Shortly after returning to the United States in 2011, he learned of his reporting obligation. He engages an accountant to prepare the required reports from 2007 to 2011. However, the government identifies a problem in the late filed reports. While those reports provided details about Mr. Bittner's largest accounts, the reports failed to address around 25 or more other accounts. So he subsequently hires a new accountant, and the new accountant and him filed corrected FBARs for. 61 accounts in 2007, 51 in, two, in 2008, 53 in 2009 and 2010, and 54 in 2011. The IRS comes in and makes a $2.72 million assessment on a per account basis. So the issue became in Bittner whether there was a single violation subject to $10,000 penalty, or did he commit a separate violation on a per account basis? So in the district court in Texas, they first held for Mr. Bittner, but then it was subsequently appealed by the government and in the Fifth Circuit upheld the 2.72 million non-willful penalty assessed by the IRS, which then put it at odds with a Ninth Circuit opinion called Boyd versus United States. Next slide, please. So let's get now to what the Supreme Court decided. In a five to four decision, the Supreme Court reversed the Fifth Circuit and held that the Bank Secrecy Act, BSA, uh, the maximum penalty is $10,000 per uh, for failure to file a compliant FBAR uh, report, i.e. it was a per report, not a per account basis. Justice Gorsuch authored the majority opinion joined by Justice Jackson in full. The majority opinion was also joined by Chief Justice Roberts, Alito, and Kavanaugh, except for Part 2C, which was the rule of lenity, which is important because that tells you there is not a majority as to the rule of lenity. And the question uh, now applies is how does that impact, if any, the, an Eighth Amendment? Uh, Justice Barrett authored a dissenting opinion joined by Justice Thomas. So, uh, uh, Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan. When I saw the combination of these judges, I don't know about you all, but my initial reaction was a rather hot place below us must have frozen over. The majority of bit opinion began the statutory analysis by examining both uh, uh, Section 31 USC 5314 and 5321. Why those sections? Well, let's look at the governing statute. Section 5321A5, capital A, uh, provides 
Penalty authorized. The Secretary of the Treasury may impose a civil monetary penalty on any person who violates or causes a violation of any provision of Section 5314. As to 5314, the court looked first to the language of the statute, noting that it does not speak of accounts or their number, but instead focuses on the legal duty to file reports. The court found the duty to be binary i.e. one either files a compliant report as, pres as prescribed by the secretary or one does not. Then the court switched back to 5321A5, capital B, little i, which provides, except as provided in subparagraph C, i.e. willfulness, the amount of any civil penalty imposed under subparagraph A shall not exceed 10,000. In analyzing the non-willful penalty provision under 5321, the court recognized a similarity to 5314. The law does not mention accounts or their number, but instead pegs the quantity of non willful penalties to the quantity of violation. And because a violation occurs under 5314 when an individual fails to file a report consistent with the statute's commands, the court found the penalties in all cases for non willful violations accrue on a per report basis. Next slide, please. Continuing its 5321 analysis, the court noted the statute tailors penalties to specific accounts only for certain willful violations. That is under 5321A5 capital D two little i, which states in part, in the case of a violation involving a failure to report the existence of an account, or any identifying information required to be provided with respect to an account, the balance in the account at the time of the violation. In rejecting the government's request for the court to infer that Congress meant to do the same for non-willful penalties, the court noted, when Congress uses certain language in one section of the statute that's omitted from a neighbor, the court usually understands that difference to convey a difference in meaning under a traditional rule of statutory construction. And my Latin's bad, so I apologize if I butcher this. Expressio unus este exclusio alturus. The rule also plagued the government similar argument concerning the statute's reasonable cause exception, which a person may invoke only on a showing of a per account accuracy. As the court stated, Congress said that a person may invoke the reasonable cause exception only on a showing of a per count accuracy. But the one thing Congress did not say is that government may impose non willful penalties on a per account basis. Next slide, slide please. Looking beyond the statutory authorities, the, the court found other contextual clues to cut against the government's position. The government was troubled by the inconsistency between the government's public comments, indicating the failure to file a report represents a single violation exposing a person to a single $10,000 non willful penalty, and the government's arguments to the court. And we'll get to that point because it's very important in terms of future litigation. The court also pointed to other inconsistencies within the drafting history of the non willful penalty provision. And as Andrea noted, uh, the regulations implementing the BSA as to those accounts that have 25 or more accounts do not be, need to be listed or provide account specific details. And the court looked at, so the court looked at the own regulations issued by the agency and that regulation is 31 CFR 1010.350 G1. So next slide. Next slide, please. So what we have in this slide is I want the audience to, to take a look at the contrast between what is a non-willful penalty and a willful penalty. And one thing that is obvious is the following. Under willful penalty, reasonable cause exception does not apply, but it does apply for non-willful penalty. And as you're going to see, what we're going to be saying, we're going to be bringing up a case pretty shortly called Bedrosian. And Bedrosian if it is accepted by the Supreme Court, because it's currently on, on cert, uh, 
is will the issue of statutory construction rear its head again? Next slide, please. So what can we expect on FBAR controversies going forward? Um, Chad, do you have any expectations as to what we can expect going forward basis? Yeah, Jim, I mean, I think that, you know, after after the decision in Bittner, um, you know, one thing that, that most practitioners who follow FBAR cases can agree on is, is that, you know, the, the per report ruling is, is going to result in, in significantly more uh, willful FBAR determinations um, you know, by the IRS. And, and that's why the Bedrosian case that you, know, that you mentioned you know, a minute ago you know, becomes, becomes critically important. Um, and of course, we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper into that uh, coming up. But you know, for, for anybody who, who might have listened to the oral argument in Bittner, or you know maybe read the transcript after after it came out, you know it, it appeared, uh, you know based on you know some of the you know comments by the justices, that you know even even those great legal minds, uh, you know lacked a, a a firm understanding of of what it means to be willful uh, in the F bar context. Um, you know for, for example, you know, one justice you know made a remark that that willfulness is a is a quote awfully hard standard. For the government to meet. Um, now, anybody who has practiced in this area can can pretty confidently state that 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 has not you know that has not been the case in in you know countless um, uh, you know litigation cases. You know, in, in in some courts, you know, willfulness has been determined you know by 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 a simple act like you know merely filing a tax return and and the schedule B was not filled out properly. Um, you know, one, one other example from, from, the, from the oral argument, uh, you know, another justice seemed to equate uh, non-willfulness uh, to, to somebody who, who was unaware of the filing requirements of, uh, for FBARs, but should have known. Um, you know, and that's another area that we'll touch on, you know, you know coming up later in this, in this presentation, but, you know, many other cases have, have demonstrated uh, that you know the objective standard uh, is the standard that's being used now uh, to to determine willfulness, which you know by definition is should have known, uh, which equals recklessness, which equals willfulness. So uh, I, I, you know the bid erosion case is, is is vital to kind of uh, close the loop on this you know, willful slash non-willful and, and, you know, what, you know, what kind of penalties we can expect on a going forward basis. Right. And following up on that, Chad, I mean, the, the, the class is just look at Bittner. I mean, and, and, and let's not, you know, deviate from, from the obvious. Here, the United States went from collect, uh, potentially collecting $2.72 million to $50,000. So the result is extrapolated to consider the full extent of lost revenue among hundreds or even thousands of current and future cases. Is the government really going to be content with a $10,000 per year per, uh, penalty? It's not unreasonable to conclude that taxpayers and practitioners are likely to see significantly more willfulness cases. And that is why getting a definition, an appropriate definition, or what constitutes willfulness is crucial and why we hope the Supreme Court does accept Bedrosian on that issue. Also, in Bittner, they cited to Skidmore uh, versus Swift. And the court noted that there was prior government guidance from the government as to its litigation, current litigation position was inconsistent with prior uh, positions taken by the government. They looked at the administrative guidance and they acknowledged it wasn't controlling. But it did impact the persuasiveness of the government's interpretation. So could the same, let, Chad, let me ask you the question. Is there any guidance out there that could impact Bedrosian um, in a similar fashion in terms of the interpretation of willfulness? Any, any guidance whatsoever, any CCAs? Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, that, the year escapes me, but uh, you know, maybe 15, 
15 years ago or so, there's certainly the chief counsel advice that um, you know, articulates the IRS's position uh, and belief that willfulness would be determined under you know what what we've come to know as the cheek standard, which is a you know voluntary uh, intentional violation of a known legal duty, um, and you know that would definitively uh, exclude you know objective recklessness from willful determinations. Right, and so the CCA, if anybody's interested, is. 2006 03026, which is 100% correct, that would cause them to basically uh, report the, the item. That again it takes into account, in, in my opinion, and there's this is a difference between reckless and willful blindness. It does take a subjective manner. In other words, did that person, knowing what he knows, basically come out with a conclusion that's contrary to what any other person? or would act in a fashion. Now, the court's been able to, in the willfulness cases, they've been able to dodge that issue under the reckless standard, and they try to implement an objective standard. And it's funny, one guiding light that gets everybody that's, that's read the Bittner opinion a little bit excited is footnote one of the opinion. And if I may, at footnote one of the majority opinion, the court says it is sidestepping a question that impacts FBAR, and that is, and I'll read you what, what directly what footnote one says. What if any mens rea, the government must prove to impose a non willful penalty is not before us? That is, the court offered no opinion as to whether a subjective standard, a cheek standard, versus an objective, reckless standard is the appropriate willfulness Standard. And, and that brings me to let me ask you, Chad, because he's dealing with this issue right now before the 11th Circuit. The current standard as to recklessness, you, you, you mentioned it before. What is recklessness? If you could sum it up in, in, in layman's terms. And this would help answer Alan's question. Well, I mean, as it as it's been articulated in in in, in many other cases, um, you know, recklessness is, you know, uh, an un, unjustifiably high risk um, of harm that is either known or it's so obvious that it should be known. And I mean, and and that really, in, you know, I, I I plan to talk about that in in greater detail a little bit later. But but that but that really raises the question. I mean, very few of these cases are ever determined on on actual knowledge. So that that, that brings us to this should have known, um, you know, and what's obvious, you know, what's what's not. Um, yeah, and, and, okay. and, and we're gonna we're gonna get to to to, to those slides. Uh, matter of fact, it'll be coming up next one. But it's funny you mentioned recklessness in in one regard. And what the audience needs to know is how the standard was adopted. And the first case really was United States versus Williams that Chad and I, unfortunately, are very familiar with. In that case, the primary issue was whether Mr. Williams' plea as a tax fraud was controlling as to the issue of willfulness for purposes of the FBAR. It was the government that raised the recommend standard. And it's cited to a Seventh Circuit case by, uh, by, by the name of Monday versus the United States. Mr. Williams, in contrast, did not even touch the issue of the applicable standard, whether it was objective versus subjective. Why? I'm not going to be disparaging Mr. Williams or his counsel, because what his brief was focused on was what was the effect of the fraud guilty plea? It was the district court that agreed with the government that the standard was reckless, and it was the district court that raised the case of Safeco versus uh, Burr, a uh, Supreme Court case. But it did held, hold at the lower court for Mr. Williams. Here's the funny part. On appeal, both parties agreed to the reckless standard to Safeco. And guess what? The Fourth Circuit said, OK, I agree with that with you guys that the standard is reckless under Safeco. And then it turned or overturned the lower court and held for the government and found that Mr. Williams was reckless. 
from here on out, the courts are stuck with this reckless standard under Safeco with no statutory analysis being done as to the proper standard of willfulness. If we can go to the next slide. And Chad, take it away. This is Pedrosia. Thanks, Jim. And, and as you mentioned, I mean, Everything that's happened with with Bittner and and the likelihood that that willful penalties will be on the increase, um, you know, that brings us to the Bedrosian case, which is the latest FBAR case to petition the Supreme Court for review. Um, and so, with the with the question, you know, lingering of of what exactly is willfulness for FBAR purposes. Um, you know, we, we kind of wait with bated breath to and and hope that, that the Supreme Court will, you know, agree to hear the case. Um, but before we get into the issues of, of what, you know, specifically would, would be determined, to give you a little bit of the brief history um, of Bedrosian. Um, you know, Mr. Bedrosian was a pharmaceutical executive who, you know, had an unreported, you know, foreign financial account for many years. Um, after his Historic CPA, you know, passed away. The, his new CPA advised him that he needed to file FBARs, um, which he did confirm with a tax attorney. Um, he ultimately filed his delinquent FBARs. The IRS conducted uh, an examination and concluded that his reporting violations were willful. Um, you know, we briefly touched on it earlier, and we're not really going to, you know, cover in any detail the jurisdictional questions uh, posed. Uh, by Bedrosian, but uh, Mr. Bedrosian did pay a, a small portion of the assessed penalty and, and filed a complaint in district court uh, seeking to recover the payment. Uh, the government countersued uh, for the amount of the full penalty. Um, <clears throat> after, uh, I believe it was a, just a one-day trial, but the, the district court concluded that um, Mr. Bedrosian's conduct was unintentional and, quote, at most negligent. Um, which, which is kind of important later. Uh, then on appeal, the Third Circuit vacated the judgment and, and remanded the case back to the district court for, for further proceedings because based on the district court's opinion, it could not, it could not conclude, uh, the, the, the appellate court could not conclude whether the district court evaluated the evidence under the objective standard. Um, and then on remand, the, the district court reversed its prior findings uh, and held that Mr. Bedrosian did willfully violate the FBAR reporting requirements. Um, and the Third Circuit affirmed that decision on a second appeal. Um, so that kind of brings us up to date um, where we sit now with you know, Mr. Bedrosian having petitioned the Supreme Court um, and asking it to decide whether willfulness should be determined, be determined uh, you know, based on an objective or a subjective standard. Um, and to articulate his concern uh, in support of his petition for cert, you know, Bedro Mr. Bedrosian pointed to the fact that on remand in the district court proceeding, no new evidence was proffered, yet the district court reversed its decision and determined that his conduct, which it originally found to be negligent at most, was now willful. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, Bedrosian is asking the Supreme Court to determine what the proper standard is for willfulness. Is it is it measured subjectively or objectively? Um, and, and, you know, what is the subjective versus objective dispute all about? Um, you know, as it as it stands today, Numerous courts have held that the objective standard applies to determine willfulness for FBAR purposes, despite willfulness not being defined anywhere uh, in the FBAR rules. Um, you know, in doing so, these courts have, have relied on a case Jim uh, alluded to earlier uh, called Safeco, which, you know, that, that case dealt with violations of, of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, you know, which which is a giant leap, you know, to the to the type of penalties, um, you know, we're talking about when we look at FBAR litigation, which can be in the you know tens of millions of dollars. Um, in in that Supreme Court case, Safeco, uh, 
um, you know, the court concluded that, you know, for civil purposes, recklessness sufficed to, to prove willfulness and that recklessness would be measured under an objective standard, which is, you know, an unjustifiably high risk of harm that is either known or so obvious that it should be known. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, very rarely are any, any FBAR litigations, um, you know, determined on, on an individual's actual knowledge. So, you know, it, it's really important to consider, you know, what does it mean then if it's so obvious? You know, what's, what's so obvious to someone who, you know, immigrated to this country and, you know, has only been here for, for a short time? Um, you know, is, 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 a, is the FBAR reporting obligation so obvious, you know, because of, of a couple of questions that appear on a single part of an income tax return that, that was prepared by someone um, who, you know, holds themselves out to be a professional and, you know, may not have been aware of the FBAR filing requirement themselves. Um, you know, one, one, thing, one thing that we have to keep in mind and, you know, over the past, you know, five to 10 years, you know, FBARs have become, you know, a hot topic, but cases that are still working them, working their way through the courts, you know, they deal with violations that were, you know, 15 years ago. Um, and so it's, it's trying to understand what, you know, the awareness and the knowledge, um, you know, that was present at that time. You know, and, and it, it's questions like these, you know, that, that demonstrate, you know, the importance uh, of the Supreme Court, you know, taking up the Bedrosian case. Uh, uh, Jack, what happens? Can, in, if you don't can I jump in real quick? Check the box no on, on, on the tax oh. return. Right. What does that mean? Yeah, I was, I was about to mention that one, Alan. I was going to say, okay. if, I may, if I may answer that one, is it, what's happening now is to make matters worse. The standard for willfulness has been diluted to a point where it operates as a de facto strict liability penalty. You would agree, Chad? That if you if you fail to what? check the box, if you read the instructions, the government's coming back and, and screaming, you are reckless. Um, even though, as Chad, you mentioned, the IRM is silent. They don't define willful. They don't define uh, uh, non-willful. Um, we were successful in, in Schwartz and Bob for the court to recognize that. Uh, they basically, the, the, uh, and I'll read you, it said, uh, imputing constructive knowledge of filing requirements to a taxpayer simply by virtue of having signed a tax return would render the distinction between a non-willful and willful violation in FBAR context meaningless. Applying United States government suggested reasoning would lead to a draconian result. And as Chad also brought out, Another thought to think about is how does the reckless and the strict liability standard reconcile with Supreme Court precedent, U.S. versus Boyd? We've all been taught or have read that a taxpayer can rely on the advice of a tax return preparer. That's the subjective test. Under Title 31, 5321, reasonable cause applies for non-willful. So are they saying that reasonable cause can at times be a subjective test? So he, where it gets really is, are they saying that you should be questioning the uh, tax advisor and its qualifications? If you take a look at a Grecian versus uh, Grecian Magnesite, uh, 149 TC3, uh, 2017, no, a taxpayer doesn't have to question the qualifications of a competent advisor. Yet, the government is saying that the lesser charge of non-wolfiness is subject to a subjective standard per the statute. But is the government then saying that the higher statute is subject to a lower reckless standard? Does this really make sense? Is the government's position in conflict with Boyle more important? is the government's position as to reckless, strict liability in conflict with the statute. And that's what, what Chad was very well articulating why Bedrosian is so important. And with that, I'll be quiet and I'll let Chad continue. Well, we're, we're running a little behind, so Chad, why don't you sort of wrap it up? 
because you have yeah, to no, I mean, that, that was pretty much all I had on, on Bedrosian. So I was just going to ask that we move to the next slide. Uh, let and, me just make the comment. We, we've had some questions, but we're going to defer on those. But uh, all of this business also, I think, could have an impact uh, on the crypto reporting uh, that now is appearing on the current uh, federal income tax return. So I think the um, sort of the standards apply not only for FBAR, but uh, perhaps for Chris, uh, crypto. What do you think about that, Jim? I needed to unmute myself. Um, I, I think there's a, there, uh, in terms of the crypto, you know, as Andrea said right now, you know, FBAR in, in theory uh, does not apply to crypto. I mean, I think we've, we've all heard the rumbling that down the road it, it, it might. And that's where really it's going to get very interesting because listening to younger minds, which know more about crypto than I do, it is hard to say that crypto is, is one asset and one asset alone. There's so many distinct facets to what is currently called crypto, it's going to be very interesting on what is the applicable standard. And so if you're going to be applying a reckless standard to crypto transactions, I think it's going to be a quagmire in terms of litigation. Chad, do you have any thoughts? Or Andrea? No, I mean, I, I disagree. I, I think it's, I think it's, you know, only, only a matter of time um, before, the, you know, the, it really ramps up um, and it will, it, it, it'll, it will eventually supplant, um, you know, kind of the common cases that we see today. Okay, we're, we're going to now move. Uh, we have two more topics. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, uh, Chad, uh, can we go uh, do the administrative procedure in the next few minutes, and then we'll uh, finish up with this case, uh, the Arresto case? Yeah, we, we can get through this pretty quick. Um, so... You know, we've talked a lot about willfulness and non-willfulness and, you know, kind of like how those have been adjudicated in the court. Um, you know, there's kind of like a new wave of, of challenges to FBAR penalties, and that has to do with, with procedural challenges, um, you know, particularly under, under the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, you know, Jim mentioned the, the Schwarzbaum case earlier, uh, and that's a, it's a, an instructive case in, in APA challenges to FBAR penalties. Um, you know, in that case, you know, the IRS uh, assessed willful penalties against Mr. Schwartzbaum, and it covered a four-year period. Um, as we noted earlier, the, the maximum willful penalty is 50% uh, of the account balance at the time of the violation. Um, and the time of the violation is, is when the FBAR is due. Um, but in, in Mr. Schwartzbaum's case, rather than, you know, determine the account balance um, as of June 30th and, and, and calculate a penalty based on that, uh, the IRS, you know, took the, the maximum aggregate balance at, at, at a single point over that four-year period, um, calculated the penalty by taking 50% of that aggregate balance, and then allocated that number uh, across all four years. Um, you know, the district court concluded that, that the IRS's methodology was, was contrary to the FBAR penalty statute, and, and therefore the, the penalties, you know, would be set aside under the APA. Um, next slide, please. But, um, you know, challenging, challenging FBAR penalties un, under the APA is not without its own set of, of obstacles. Um, you know, the APA says that a reviewing court shall hold unlawful and set aside agency action that it finds to be arbitrary, capricious, abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance with law. And, and, and that was the precise uh, you know, rationale for, for setting aside the penalties in the Schwarzbaum case. It, it, it was directly contrary um, to, the, to the penalty statute. Um, well, once a review in court you know, decides that an agency has violated um, you know, the APA, uh, it, the standard remedy is, is to set aside that agency action. So that, so that brings us to the question of, of what happens then once those penalty you know, assessments have been set aside? Um, you know, we don't have concrete answers uh, for that. Um, we're actively litigating uh, 
uh, those issues right now. Um, you know, under administrative law principles, the matter should be remanded to the IRS uh, for, for corrective action. You know, but when it's remanded to the IRS, you know, is, 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 the, is the agency's attempt to calculate penalties that comply with law, is, is that, does that represent a new assessment? You know, if it does, as we would maintain it does, um, you know, that's in all likelihood, in many cases, it's going to violate the six-year statute of limitations uh, on assessment. Um, you know, and we also need to consider what happens, you know, if, if the court does or does not retain jurisdiction over the matter while it's on remand to the IRS. Um, you know, the FBAR, FBAR rules contain a two-year statute of limitations uh, on bringing an action to, to collect the penalty. You know, so if the court determines the assessments are invalid, remands the matter to the IRS, does not retain jurisdiction, you know, it would seem the government would have to initiate a new lawsuit, which, which, would, which would most certainly you know, not fall within that you know, two-year limitations period. Um, you know, like I mentioned, those are, those are just a couple of the issues that, that we are actively litigating um, you know, in, the, in the Schwartzbaum case. And, um, you know, Jim, unless you have any comments on, on APA, um, you know, I'll turn it over to Alan and so he can uh, get us going on the arrest day case. All yours, Alan. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you for such an interesting and intensive discussion of uh, the issues arising from Bittner and the willfulness, non-willfulness. Uh, now we're going to switch gears to something which is uh, very interesting and somewhat unusual, uh, and if you could go to the next slide. Uh, this case arose in California, and the case uh, which was in district court uh, addresses the issue of whether an individual who is what we call a lawful permanent resident under U.S. tax law but a treaty resident under the treaty tiebreaker provisions of a bilateral income tax treaty is required to file an FBAR. Well, what do we mean by those particular terms? Uh, for those of you who work in the area, you know that uh, a non-citizen can be a resident of the United States and subject to tax on worldwide income, basically if two circumstances exist, the individual meets what's called the substantial presence test. And that test essentially provides that if the individual is physically present in the United States for a particular period of time over a three year rolling average, then that person becomes a resident of the United States. We're not dealing with that type of an animal in this situation. We're dealing with the other category of resident, which is basically an individual who, rather than coming here under a non-immigrant visa, comes here under a, an immigrant visa, which entitles the person to live and work here and that person, when uh, he or she enters the United States uh, with the uh, visa is treated as a, a U.S. resident and a U.S. person. And this type of a person uh, often is called a green card holder because of the color of the card that identifies that person as a lawful permanent resident. Um, historically had been green. Uh, and it's not uncommon for green card holders to get a green card, but then leave the United States or spend a significant amount of time outside the United States. And those persons need to be careful about what they do and how they do it, because if they spend too much time outside the United States and then want to come back into the United States, the uh, Immigration services can pull the green card or cause issues. In our case, we are dealing with a, a individual who was a Mexican resident, um, which means that he was a, a resident of Mexico for internal law purposes, as well as a resident uh, 
of the United States under the lawful permanent resident test, uh, internal law for U.S. Uh, uh, tax purposes. And that person, because of his dual status, would ostensibly be paying tax to both countries, but a bilateral income tax treaty enables the person to review a four-factor test to determine where that person had a closer connection. Uh, and if that person had a closer connection, say, to his home country, in this case, Mexico, then that person uh, could, uh, by filing certain forms and so on, uh, be treated as a resident of Mexico as a non-resident of the United States for federal income tax purposes. And that's what uh, Mr. Arresto did. He said he had a closer connection to Mexico, and he therefore uh, was viewed as a non-resident of the United States for bilateral income tax treaty, although uh, he still retained his green card and was viewed as a resident of the United States uh, under internal law, because under the lawful permanent resident test, an individual can only uh, sort of get rid of his green card status if it is rescinded by the immigration services, or it's abandoned, which includes sending a letter to the immigration services or through administrative or judicial action. And in the case of our friend here, uh, he did not file um, uh, FPARs and was assessed uh, non-filing non penalties, uh, as Andre was explaining uh, in terms of uh, uh, his situation. Now, the case uh, is complicated procedurally, but the individual um, had uh, filed a lawsuit with the, the district court, which was handled by a magistrate judge in, in contesting these penalties, but really contesting how much of the IRS administrative file he could receive to make his case. And so the case did not deal with the substantive issue of whether this individual was uh, a, a, a resident of Mexico. It did not deal with the issue of whether he could not file or file an FBAR, but was an administrative dispute as to how much of the IRS file this person could get to prove his case that he uh, was a non-resident of Mexico, and if he was so treated as a non-resident of Mexico, his proposition that because he was a Mexican resident, uh, he was not required to file uh, the FBAR. And that uh, all related to the fact that this individual, when he made the treaty tiebreaker election, filed the uh, appropriate Internal Revenue Service Form 1040 NR to be treated as a non-resident for income tax purposes. And he filed another form, this IRS Form 88 Treaty 3, uh, claiming treaty benefits. If we can go to the uh, next slide, uh, please, um, which essentially is repetitive of, of what I have said, uh, and then go to the argument of the parties. Um, the uh, parties uh, in this evidentiary dispute be before the magistrate judge, which is, uh, Jim, and maybe you can explain the difference between a magistrate judge and a, a, a judge in, in the federal courts before mm -hmm. we go on? Sure. Usually when you go to a U.S. district court, uh, you have a, you know, what you call the, the judge in the case. And then you have a magistrate judge, and the magistrate judge is basically there to, one, give the parties the option, do you want to hear the case by a magistrate? Or, and usually the parties will say no. So what the magistrate will do is take over what's called 
the discovery procedures. Uh, sometimes a magistrate will take over uh, any any preliminary uh, motions, potentially dispositive motions. But in this case, the magistrate was looking, as Alan has said, at the discovery request made by the plaintiff. Um, and uh, the, the magistrate is not the uh, the judge assigned to the case. Uh, he's just basically there. If you think about it um, from a U.S. tax court perspective, think about your, your special trial judges. That would be kind of like an equivalent to a magistrate. Alan? Thanks, Jim. So the nub of the dispute was whether the individual status under the Mexican U.S. Income Tax Treaty has any bearing on whether the individual was properly considered a U.S. person for purposes of filing the FBAR, but really only related to how much information uh, the uh, plaintiff could get from the IRS administrative file. Because what Mr. Areste was arguing was a treaty tiebreaker and a Mexican resident, then under the tax treaty, he was not a U.S. person, which was the requirement uh, in order to file a, uh, an FBAR, but not really going into the point that under internal law, uh, Mr. Areste didn't lose his status as a green card holder, and we're going to talk about that a little more as, as I go on. The government, uh, in this case, which uh, was, we believe, represented by just a trial attorney from the Department of Justice rather than someone from the tax division, uh, made the argument that the individual status under the Mexican treaty was irrelevant because the treaty only deals with residency for purposes of income tax and excise taxes under the Internal Revenue Code, which is Title 26 of the U.S. Code, rather than dealing with anything under Title 31, where the FBAR uh, penalties uh, arise. So it, it's saying the, the treaty, uh, the tax or the, the amounts you're talking about were not uh, income taxes under the Bilateral Income Tax Treaty. Next slide, please. The magistrate then referred to a very obscure section which came uh, 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 out in 2008 as part of the expatriation provisions, and I'll go into that a little more, which said that um, an individual, you can see the language below in the italicized portion of the bottom of the slide, an individual shall, shall cease to be treated as a lawful permanent resident of the U.S. if such person commences to be treated as a resident of a foreign country under the provisions of a tax treaty, and the, and, and the individual does not waive treaty benefits and, and notifies the IRS of the commencement of such treatment, which was by filing the Form 1040-NR and this other Form 88 33. So she was relying on uh, the flush language of this section 7701B6, which deals with lawful permanent residence, which says when you first, if you have a, a, a if you if you are gained the status of a lawful permanent resident uh, and you enter the United States, you are a U.S. resident, and you can only relinquish that stat, uh, status by having it rescinded or abandoned it. Uh, abandoning the status. This individual did neither of those things, but under the flush language which came out uh, in 2008, as opposed to the original statutory section, which was in the uh, early 80s, uh, the, the, the flush language says you no longer are a um, permanent resident for tax purposes if, if you do those two conditions. So the magistrate judge, under a five-step analysis, said, okay, under 7701B6, this person is, is not a, um, a lawful permanent resident. If you look to the uh, other definitions in the code, the, the, per, uh, the person uh, 
a, a person who is a lawful per, uh, permanent resident is a resident alien, and a resident alien is, is a U.S. person if you go through the other steps. And the uh, magistrate judge said, therefore, in paragraph five, any person allowed to permanently reside in the U.S. by virtue of U.S. immigration laws must file an FBAR unless that person is entitled to be treated as a resident of a foreign country under a bilateral uh, tax treaty and concluded that the uh, individual's tax residency under the treaty is directly relevant to, indeed, it is outcome determinative of the issue of whether he was required to file the FBAR at issue in this case, never once going to the point that the basic flush language, the, the, the basic statutory language of the green card holder uh, was not met. He didn't rescind his green card status, nor did he um, uh, abandon the status. Now, what does all of this mean in the context of um, uh, what a number of commentators on the next slide has said is a possible defense to, 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 to filing uh, um, FBARs. And at least from my perspective, the short answer is that the an analysis and conclusions of the ma magistrate judge are, are not clear cut because various other points were never seemingly presented to the judge uh, uh, in terms of its analysis. Uh, and let me start by first saying that the uh, internal revenue uh, regular or the treasury regulations can say, contain a provision that if you are a treaty tiebreaker uh, for code purposes, uh, you still maintain your status as a lawful permanent resident for purposes of determining uh, whether a foreign corporation in which you have an interest is a controlled foreign corporation, which applies to uh, situations where, where generally there is uh, other shareholders, even though if you are a treaty tiebreaker, uh, and viewed as a U.S. person under internal law, you don't pick up the income under the CFC provisions. But uh, in terms of what we have been talking about and just the form filing or the international form filing, in general, um, the, the basic understanding of practitioners is, even though not explicitly provided in this regulation, which is... Uh, Section 301.7701B-7 is that if you are a treaty tiebreaker, for the most part, you have to file various of these internal revenue information returns like the Form 5471 and various other forms. Now, that was never discussed in the case because it was only dealing with FBAR situations, not internal revenue code provisions, and, and they're discrete under the U.S. code. But the main issue, which is of concern, is that the provision 7701B6 uh, came out as a conforming amendment to the uh, expatriation provisions, which uh, is a topic uh, of itself, but under the expatriation provisions for purposes of our analysis, a lawful permanent resident, a green card holder, who is a, a lawful permanent resident at any time in a period of eight out of 15 years before relinquishing his or her green card, is essentially equated to be like a U.S. citizen and subject to the expatriation provisions if that person meets the requirements of being what's called a covered expatriate, that is, a, a person who gives up his citizenship or green card, who, has a, um, a, who meets a threshold income tax liability 
of a certain amount for the past five years or a sort of a net worth requirement of $2 million before expatriation or is non-compliant under Title 26. And the question that really goes to whether 7701B6 can apply to any um, treaty tiebreaker, and that's what the flush language says, or is limited to, uh, to uh, lawful permanent residents who are what we call long-term residents, those people who are um, uh, lawful permanent residents eight out of 15 years, is does 7701B6 apply just on the face of the language as a conforming amendment, or does it only apply to individuals who um, are uh, long-term residents and actually expatriate? Because the effective date provision of 7701B6 uh, uh, is tied into the expatriation provisions, which apply to uh, expatriations after um, a certain date in 2008. This was never discussed in the magistrate judge's opinion, but uh, I would note that uh, since 7701B6 came out in 2008, a number of commentators have said it would be very risky to rely on 7701B6 to say that if you're just a normal treaty tiebreaker, um, you, you, you are governed by the plain language of the provision. You really have to be um, a long-term resident who has expatriated, particularly because of the significant penalties. And, and so that was never discussed in the analysis by the magistrate judge. The other point that wasn't discussed, going to the FBAR regulations, which are the guidance uh, put out by FinCEN as to filing FBARs in the preamble to those reg regulations, which is you know could be argued as non-controlling, but evidence is an intent of FinCEN. It says a legal permanent resident who elects under a tax treaty to be treated as a non-resident for tax purposes must still file the FBAR. If we go to the next slide, please. The, the point here is none of this was discussed by the magistrate judge. And I think there has to be a determination as to whether 7701B6 applies based on the plain reading of the statute, which doesn't have any language about long-term residents uh, or anything like that. It just says what it says or only applies to uh, people who are long-term residents and expatriates. And the criticism of the way 7701B6 is drafted is that in order to ascertain that answer, you would have to look at the effective date provisions of 7701B6, which came out in 2008. We're now in 2023, you know, 15 years later. So unless you knew about these crazy expatriation provisions, you could say, ah, under 7701B6, uh, I can use this provision of um, a treaty tiebreaker. All of this stuff hasn't been uh, determined. And so I think it is risky to say that uh, uh, this is uh, sort of a, a, a done deal and, and you, you, you can view yourself as a non-resident for FBAR purposes. Uh, also, maybe more significance is if that analysis is correct, then when you go to the various uh, forms required of U.S. residents who are uh, um, who 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 uh, are treaty tiebreakers, either uh, substantial, well, not substantial per, uh, presence persons, but green card persons who treaty tiebreak, you can make the argument that if you're a resident for treaty purposes, uh, you're not required to file various of these forms, except uh, certain forms which are specified in the third bullet which would mean that you can avoid filing all the particular forms that are required of persons who are U.S. residents uh, under internal law. So uh, 
the question then comes, does it make sense for a, um, a treaty tiebreaker to have to file any of these forms in the first place? The argument could be, no, it doesn't, because all these forms really reflect uh, income or activities that relate to um, your, your tax situation. And if you're a treaty tiebreaker and a non-resident, you, you really, it's not relevant to the Internal Revenue Service. All, all of this has not been uh, dis decided in the case. So uh, as you can see, what this case does is in an evidentiary hearing is uh, sort of uh, provide an argument to say that if you have uh, 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 FBAR penalties asserted to you and against you and you're a treaty tiebreaker, you have an argument, but the, 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 the substantive issue is whether you have any argument at all, because uh, you could say that the 7701B6, even though it says what it says on the plain language, only applies to tax avoidance expatriates. And we didn't know, we don't know if Mr. Arresti is a long-term resident, if, and if in fact he actually expatriated. So uh, it's a really interesting case, and we'll see what further develops. And, and Jim or and the rest of our panel, do you have any thoughts or comments on all this? Yeah, Alan, I think you you, you nailed the, 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 the head on, on, on the, 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 uh, the issue. You just nailed the issue. I mean, this is an interesting case. I mean, the one thing is most practitioners are wondering what the government's going to do. Uh, are they going to try to go before the, the judge or are they going to try to do an interlocutory appeal and appeal this decision? Um, when you read the pleadings in this case, uh, taxpayer made no bones why he wanted the administrative uh, file. It had to do somewhat with that far, but more important, he had ongoing litigation on uh, in district court concerning some financial reporting penalties, and he wanted to see what the how the IRS had made that determination. Um, the The question is, the case presents more questions, factual questions, and and some very interesting legal issues, as Alan has pointed out. What I would always recommend is. This is an issue that if you do have an F4 case and you do have uh, a dual resident issue with a treaty, you have to strongly consider raising this issue and allowing the courts to flush out the issue. Andrea or Chad, do you have any thoughts on, on, on this case? And I think that's right. Um, you know, I have a hard time, I guess, getting past the fact that there are specific carve outs. Um, for 8938, 8621, not for FBARs, and the preamble to the FBAR specifically states FBAR should be required um, to be filed. Again, that goes back to the FBARs part of um, Title 31, not tax. So, um, you know, you, you can look to the preamble when there's ambiguity. I think there is ambiguity. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't not file an FBAR um, based on this. But if I was caught, I would certainly raise the issue and try to get out of the upper penalty. Yeah, that, that's the best way to say it, Andrew. I think you hit it right on the, on the head. If, 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 if you're concerning not filing because of this case, uh, um, I think you hit it, don't. But if, if they do knock on your door, you have a potential argument. That's a great way of, of, of stating it. Uh, just uh, as, as we're concluding and before we sort of wrap up, uh, another case just came out a few days ago saying that uh, for purposes of filing, uh, for purposes of penalties under the, um, um, for non-filing form 5471, the IRS doesn't have uh, the um, authority on uh, the Ferry case. We probably will be doing a webinar on that particular case uh, in the next few weeks and we'll send out an announcement. But before we close, maybe each of you could just uh, give a sort of a parting comment about FBARs in general, and, and then we'll conclude because we have about a few minutes left. Jim, ladies first, right? Andrea. Uh, Andrea, why don't okay. you go first, ladies first? I would just say there were some questions that came in that were kind of specific 
um, FBAR questions, happy to address those. Feel free to reach out to any of us here on the panel. We'd be happy to run through specific questions for you after this presentation. Jen? No, I mean, I just, I just think that, you know, what we've shown here today is that, you know, even though, you know, we see a lot of FBAR cases and, you know, they, when they all start to tilt one way, you start to feel that things become well settled, but, you know, that's not necessarily the case, you know, between, between Vintner and, and now with a rest day, um, you know, it's, it's, it's ever changing. Um, and, you know, we monitor these developments, you know, basically daily. Um, and just to reiterate Andrea's, you know, comments, you know, feel free to, to contact any of us and, and we're happy to have a conversation. We, we like having these conversations. So, um, Look forward to talking to you later. Jim? Sure. I mean, first of all, thank you for attending. Uh, and second, I said that to everybody's point. I think right now, the reason we were talking about Bittner and we talked about the APA, and then we quickly pivoted to the Bredosian is we really believe uh, that the statute needs clarification. Um, and Bredosian will give everybody an opportunity to get that clarification in terms of what is willful. Right now, uh, I'm certain that most people in this audience have had fact patterns that you look at it and you look at the IRS agent and you say, how can you come up with that determination? What is the difference between a non-willful and a willful taxpayer? The IRS doesn't want to give us that answer. Bedrosian gives us that opportunity. And if the, if, if the, if the court does accept Bedrosian, we hope that the court will then say it needs to be a subjective test. And if that is the case, because even in Bittner, if you look at the transcripts as Chad was telling you, citing to some of those transcripts, then, then it's game on. Then we're back into what really does constitute willfulness. And those taxpayers that, as Alan has mentioned, that are dual citizens or have lived primarily in Europe and happen to be also U.S. citizens, the onus will be on the government to prove that these individuals who knew nothing about U.S. law we're acting in a willful fashion. And we would really, really enjoy seeing those cases go to trial because I think at that point in time, we can see the government do a pivot and either treat these cases as not willful or having reasonable cause. Alan, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Just one correction, uh, U.S. residents as opposed U.S. to- U.S. residents, sorry, Alan. But so thank you all for your time. We hope uh, this was helpful. And until next time, uh, have a good day and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.